Missing out on your summer holidays this year? Well, why not go on a sound journey with Maddie Moat and discover the exciting sounds of science and nature from the comfort of your own home? In each podcast episode, Maddie is joined by experts to guide you on all kinds of journeys into a beehive, down the plug hole, or even up into a cloud. And along the way, you'll help Maddie create a new piece of music made from the noises you discover. Listen out for interesting sounds as you go along. You'll be going to some very interesting places because sound explorers can go anywhere. The first five episodes are available to listen to now. So what are you waiting for? Just search for Maddie's Sound Explorers wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hello, welcome along to the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan, thank you so much for listening. Now, if you've been back to school uh, this week or you're not going back quite yet, I hope that right now you are ready to learn some really smart science stuff because this week we're talking about one of the stinkiest plants ever. You can also hear about the race for hypersonic planes and I'll answer some of the questions that you've left as reviews over on Apple Podcasts. Today they're on paper, mosquitoes and your voice box. We'll get to those in just a sec. First, let's catch up with one of our favourite geniuses on the show. This is Karina and her superhero alter ego, K-Mystery. K-Mystery. Elements in danger. Hi, Karina here. I'm pretty lucky to have a superhero alter ego and one who knows all about chemistry. Isn't that right, K-Mystery? Hey, K-Mystery? Where are you? You're right, Karina. K-Mystery is the name and chemistry is the game. I think I prefer the games on my tablet. Without chemistry, there wouldn't be any tablets. Did you know that some of the chemical elements we need to make things like tablets and mobile phones are in danger? You mean, like there's some sort of space monster about to gobble them up? No, silly. The elements are in danger because they're simply running out. The more and more we use them, the less the resources remain. Come on, I'll show you. Let's find out about one very special element we couldn't do without. Arsenic. Hey, that's my phone! It's getting bigger! Or am I getting smaller? Hang on! We're going too fast! We're gonna... Ah, thought so. Crash. Screens on tablets and phones use types of material made with arsenic to help carry the electrical charge from your finger. You'll find arsenic in the circuits too, and it all starts here. Arsenic is a type of element we call crystalline metalloid. It's found down here, buried in the Earth's crust, and finding it is tricky. It's mostly squidged together with a bunch of other elements, which makes it hard to get enough to use. We know about arsenic thanks to a very interesting person. Come on, we need to go back in time. It might feel a bit weird. <laughs> See that guy in the robes? Looks like he's got a bunch of cauldrons bubbling away. Something cooking? That's Albert Magnus. He was a 13th century alchemist. That's someone who tries to create something from something else. He thought he could make gold from other elements if only he could just get the recipe right. And through his experiments, he discovered arsenic. Ew. Arsenic is well known as a poison. Some say it was used to kill Napoleon Bonaparte. (gasps) But weirdly, it's also used as a medicine. In farming and even in makeup, Victorian ladies used it as face powder. Sounds like a pretty stupid idea if you ask me, with that whole being a poison thing. I know, right? Anyway, it's also super good at conducting electricity, which is where we come back to where we started. My phone! My poisonous phone! I mean, should I be touching it? Arsenic sounds kind of dangerous. I mean, useful, sure, but... It's in tiny amounts, and unless you're using your screen in a really weird way, it can't get in your mouth, so don't worry about it. What you do need to worry about is that arsenic will run out. In less than 100 years. Yeah... I guess that's not very long. So, what are we going to do? There's plenty you can do. 
More gadgets mean more elements are needed. So, simply buying fewer phones and tablets, well, we could start preserving the resources that we have, sharing and reusing technology you don't need anymore, and recycling them when they're broken. Some of these rare elements can be recovered and used again. So, you're saying if I help out, I'm kind of being a chemistry superhero too, just like you. No one is just like me, Karina. But you'll be the next best thing. <laughs> Thanks, K-Mystery. K-Mystery, Elements in Danger. With support from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Find out more and get hands-on with chemistry at funkidslive.com slash chemistry. It's question time, question time. My favourite part of the show, really, it's when you send over the, the science thing that is niggling around your brain, that you're waking up in the middle of the night just wondering about. You can he- let me answer it, turn me into like a science Sherlock, really. Leave it as a review for the podcast over on Apple Podcasts, if that's how you're listening. We start off today with one from Louise, who is 12 years old, who wants to know how paper's made. Now, mostly paper is made from trees, but it can be made from loads more stuff that has fibres in it, really, stuff like cotton or bamboo. Uh, And it sounds really easy, and I think it is really easy. I've seen videos online where people just make paper at home. Uh, Basically, you take a plant, you bash it around to release the fibres, which is what makes it up. Then you mix those fibres with water, and it becomes quite thick and gloopy. It makes what they call a pulp. Then you spread that pulp out on a sheet of wire, you leave it, you let it dry so the fibres knit and merge together, and then it becomes paper. It really is that simple. It's like a three-stage process. Thank you very much for the question, Louise. This one is from Cooper White from Wisconsin over in America. Cooper, thank you so much for the question. Uh, He has 72 mosquito bites. That's what he says. And basically, he says, why? Why? Why do mosquitoes bite him more than anyone else? I mean, they don't really touch me when I'm outside in the garden on a hot day, Cooper. So there must be something different inside you than there is with me. And it turns out that's true. They do prefer some people to others. Now, there could be a lot of reasons why they like you more than me. It might just be that you produce more of the chemicals that they like, uh, like lactic acid. Maybe you make more lactic acid than other people. There is also some evidence that says that the blood type O attracts more mozzies than other blood groups. So maybe you're one of those. Uh, Also, uh, how much carbon dioxide you release when you burn energy is pretty important because that attracts mosquitoes as well. So there's a lot of different reasons why you could attract more mozzies than other Cooper. But we're kind of moving into September now. I'm not really sure what it's like up in Wisconsin, but I hope they do leave you alone pretty soon Uh, and finally today this is from finley who is six years old who wants to know how the voice box works now the technical name for the voice box finley is the larynx it's a small tube that sits in your throat on the windpipe it's attached to a bone that's connected to your tongue and inside that tube uh, is some small bands of tissue now when you speak you move those bands tighter or looser And then you push air through the tube, which hits the bands and makes different sounds depending on whether they're loose or whether they're tight. Uh, It's quite simple to get your head around, I think, Finley. It's a little bit like playing a guitar or playing any stringed instrument, really. But thank you very much for the question. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on this show, you need to get yourself to Apple Podcasts, if that's how you're listening. Find the Fun Kids Science Weekly and then leave us a review with it in there. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, we're talking about STEM today uh, because it turns out that kids, people just like you, loads of you, uh, see STEM as one of the most amazing careers that you could have. So to help us talk about this, we've got Ying Wan Lo on the line. She's the 2019 Young Woman Engineer of the Year. Hey, Ying. Hello, how thank, are you? Thank you so much for joining us. I'm brilliant. Now, um, tell me how you got started with STEM. You're the Young Woman Engineer of the Year. It's an incredible title and feat. Uh, how have you got this far? Well, when I was younger, I really liked Lego. And when it comes to choosing a career, I wanted to do something that helps the society at a larger scale. And I thought, well, the most tangible way to do that is by being an engineer. So um, so I've took a degree in engineering at university. And since then, I've worked on 
hybrid electric uh, propulsion aircrafts, um, wireless sensor network technology, great stuff that can help us be a sustainable future in the, in the world. So your skills, what you've learned through school and at university, what is it that you have learned that has helped you be so adaptable? One minute you're working on this, the next minute you're working on that. What is it that you, what are your skills, would you say, that make you really good at that? I think the most important skill is problem solving. So it's like putting a puzzle together or trying to solve a quiz. So it's the same in engineering where you will have a question or a problem and then you take it apart into smaller pieces and simpler chunks and then you try to solve it and you put it back together. Now I'm looking at some um, some, some stats that have been fired over and it, and it turns out um, more people want to be engineers right now than be uh, like TV presenters and be pop stars and things like that. Why, <laughs> uh, why are people looking at STEM careers in a new light? Well, this new IET research really has shown that more children are now interested in STEM because of the pandemic. And in this in this recent time, um, the media has showcased role models that children can relate to. And, and it also highlights positive impact of the work that STEM professionals are doing. For example, we've seen the fantastic NHS doctors saving lives. We've seen engineers building ventilators, scientists developing vaccines for the world and and literally saving millions of lives. So I think all these really raise awareness of importance of STEM in society. Now, STEM is science, technology, engineering uh, and maths. What uh, if so many more people want a career in STEM? What are you hoping that this might mean for the future of science and the future of engineering? Well, we know that now that there are currently not enough engineers to fulfill the demand in the future. So with more young people now thinking about career in STEM, it could be really positive for the future with now a new and diverse generation really, really sorry, ready to tackle the world's problem. It's interesting you say diverse there mm-hmm. because they've got all, all these numbers that have been brought out and there still is there's still a little difference between uh, girls and boys that that want to that want to kind of take up STEM, especially in how people believe that young girls and young boys want to do it. Why do you think this gap still exists? Why do we see? Why do some people still see engineering as a boy thing to do? Whereas you, you're the 2019 Young Woman Engineer of the Year. Why do people still think this? Well, I think on the research it says. of girls say that this has inspired them to consider careers in engineering against um, 60% of boys. And well, as an engineer, I I think, you know, I understand that it can be perceived as a male dominated industry, but actually there's a huge range of careers available and there are hundreds of women engineers out there doing amazing things. So in my own experience, having female role models to look up to in my career really gave me the confidence that gender is not a barrier. So back to the key point, we know that we need more women in STEM. So this is a great opportunity right now to highlight the role that we do and attract more young girls into the industry. Just two follow-up questions from that then. Uh, You you said about role models. Mm -hmm. I don't suppose you could, off the top of your head to put you on the spot, just give you maybe a few role models that that girls who might be listening to this who don't who do want to get involved in engineering but don't really know who to be inspired by. Who, Who inspired you? Well, so the first one is Marie Curie. She's the first one, the first scientist that I, uh, first female scientist that I learned about in school. She's got two Nobel Prize. Uh, she's won two Nobel Prize, and I thought that's really impressive. And I wanted to be more like her growing up. And and I think she's a, she's a massive inspiration. The other one is Ada Lovelace. She's the first computer programmer in the world, and and you know she's um she's, she's based in she's from the UK, and and I think um. She's fantastic inspiration for many young girls, potentially looking into computer science and, and be a software developer or a programmer like her. Now, also, also you mentioned <clears throat> careers in, in STEM. Going forward, if, if people listening love science, they love tech, engineering, maths, what, what careers are there out there? What jobs could they do? Because there's so many of them. Give us a few mm-hmm. examples. Yes, there are plenty of careers and there's something for everyone. So, for example, um, I'm a manufacturing engineer. I make stuffs in the factory um, or design stuff, how things are being made in the factories. And there are performance engineers that um, 
make sure that the, the products they make meet the performance requirements, the systems engineers, electronic engineers, mechanical engineers, and they build planes, bridges, future cities, and even develop new healthcare technologies. Uh, and what are your big hopes for the future uh, of, of engineering and technology? I mean, you're right there at the coalface. You see much more of it than anyone else. Uh, <laughs> where do you think we might be in, in, in 10, 20, 50 years time? What are going to be the new big things? Well, I really believe that STEM professionals will continue to develop technology that would transform our lives. So given the current climate, I would say that I hope that we eliminate the pandemic find cures for other disease and create a sustainable solutions for future generations. And if there are you know, young people listening to this, I hope that you can be the heroes of the future. And how do they do that, uh, Ying? Have you got any advice for if someone has been inspired by the recent efforts of people in the NHS, scientists, doctors? Um, what, what would be your, your key things to remember? Well, I would say STEM is a really fantastic career where you can develop deliver a positive impact to the world. And I personally enjoy the dynamic nature of being an engineer. So my advice is get a career in STEM if you want to shape the future and just go for it. And if anyone's interested in finding out more information, um, they can go on the IET's education website or go on uh, engineerabetterworld.org for more information. Uh, and just one last question on that. Um, what's going on over the summer uh, to, to keep kids' imaginations going and keep their inspiration with STEM while they're out of school? Um, as a STEM ambassador myself, I'm taking part in a lot of virtual STEM events this summer, talking to young people and giving them some advice and mentoring. And I think virtual and digital STEM outreach really get to reach a lot more children um, during this time in the lockdown. So I would say go online, Check out the IET website. There are plenty of resources, case studies of real life STEM professionals and get some inspiration. Brilliant. Ying, thank you so much for joining us on the Science Weekly. Now, this week's Dangerous Dan is a little bit different, but stay there because it's not really dangerous at all. But it's a pretty freaky flower that you need to hear about. And it sounds like it should be deadly. Let me introduce you to the corpse flower. Uh, it's one of the world's largest and rarest flowering plants. They've got these huge petals that look like a bowl. They circle a thick trunk that rises up from the middle. They grow to around well, almost five metres high. Some only bloom once in like 30 years. And when they do, they only do it for a few days. Now, you find it in the wild in Asia. And how it makes sure the species carries on is pretty amazing. Now, it's called the corpse flower because when it is in bloom, when it's flowering, it makes this stinking smell like like rotten meat or a decaying body. <sighs> now, the smell might make you and me, like regular humans, run away. Um, but it attracts some pollinators like dung beetles, fresh flies, carnivorous insects, uh, creatures that normally eat dead, rotting flesh. Now, the plant is even quite a rich dark burgundy colour to make it look like a dead animal. Now the idea, it's really smart science, the idea is that the insects think that the flower, the flower might be food. Uh, they get inside, realise that it's not food, it's not a, a rotting animal, it's just a, a, another plant. Uh, but then they accidentally fly off with the plant's pollen caught in their legs, so they spread it without knowing and they make new plants. Come on, how amazing is that? This plant, this corpse flower, this plant that stinks of death, makes sure other creatures help it carry on living. It's time to catch up with one of our favourite inventors on the show now. This is Sir Sidney McSprocket. Sir Sidney McSprocket's Great British Minds. Oh, hello, Sir Sidney McSprocket here. No, I've been told many a time that my inventions are, well, somewhat odd. I'll admit that the Alsatian vibration station never really caught on. <laughs> caught fire, yes. But you know, I don't mind a bit. When you think about some of our greatest inventors, creators and designers, well, they didn't mind people thinking their adventures were a little crazy or weird or maybe silly. Being able to play with an idea and have fun with it can make all sorts of things happen. 
<laughs> After all, why should only children get to play? Oh, good. There's just enough time before tea. Take the Great Exhibition of 1851. It was a celebration in Victorian times of the greatest innovations from Britain and some other places in the world. Some of the most weird and wonderful contraptions were on show. And not many were as um, unique as the silent alarm bed. Invented by R.W. Savage, a mechanism connected to an alarm clock would tip a sleeping person out of bed at a time of their choosing, perhaps even into a bath of cold water. It sounds like something from <laughs> Wallace and Gromit, doesn't it? <laughs> but however silly the idea sounds, the demonstration drew many visitors, and I imagine he even had a few orders. After all, it is quite the job to get going of a morning, I find. And here's a 21st century mind I'd like to introduce you to. Someone else who was interested in keeping things moving and came up with another quite unique idea. Pavement power! Yes, I did say pavement power. Words seldom heard together, I'll grant you. How on earth can a boring old pavement generate power? Can you imagine? Well, someone did, and got creating and invented PaveGen. Let's meet the inventor, Lawrence Kemble Cook. PaveGen is a smart flooring system which harnesses the kinetic power of people's footsteps and converts it into green energy. Kinetic power just means the power generated by movement. To date, PaveGen has captured over half a billion footsteps. Oh, that's a lot of electricity. So, how does it work? It sounds like magic, doesn't it? Well, as people step on the top surface, their weight causes generators underneath the tiles to rotate, creating electricity power via something called the electromagnetic induction, which is a way that magnets can generate electricity. A paved gen walkways can have sensors built into their tiles that capture and analyse data, such as the number of steps and energy created, which can help power street or office lights, all without having to burn any fossil fuels, which are harmful for the environment. And the more steps you take, the more electricity there will be. So you'll be in better shape as well. So you can see, playing with ideas, however crazy they might seem, is something many great minds have in common. If you like experimenting and having fun, then perhaps you'll be a great mind too. Oh golly, tea time already. I better go. And my cheese weighed tea's maid is serving up a lovely cup of tea and a cheese biscuit to go with it. What could be nicer? Tatty bye for now. Sir Sidney McSprocket's Great British Minds. With support from the Royal Commission 1851. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash McSprocket. Right, let's get to this week's Science in the News. Now, companies from Britain, the US, China and Russia, they're spending a lot of money into aircraft that can fly at five times the speed of sound. They're bat battling it out to build engines that can fly at speeds that normally would melt jet engines. The idea is to have this hypersonic flight by the 2030s in about 10 years' time, which mean you might be able to go from London to Sydney the entire world away uh, that normally takes about a day right now. You could do that flight in just four hours. Also, this week, engineers in America have tested booster rockets for NASA. These are part of the project that will send Americans back to the moon in 2024. They'll form part of NASA's Space Launch System SLS rocket, which is the biggest one built since the 1960s. And finally, satellite tags have shown the secrets of the UK's smallest seabird. 
adult storm petrols were filled with GPS tags up in Shetland, which is an island to the north of Scotland, and scientists have used those to see what they're doing. It turns out that these birds regularly travel up to 186 miles to feed, uh, and they were found flying to a colony 68 miles away, which experts never knew about. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. If you've got a sciencey question that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it for me as a review over on Apple Podcasts. Find us on there. There's a little comment box at the bottom. That is where you leave your question. Drop your name as well so I can say hello. And five stars will really help me see it. Uh, if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts, send us an email. Use the contact form over at funkidslive.com. Now, if you've, you, if you've loved some of the uh, science episodes that you've heard in the show today, we've got loads more of them for you over on our Apple, uh, on Google, Spotify, on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. And remember, Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all day, every day, right the way through the week on your DAB digital radio uh, on that free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. 